Hi everyone, Dr. Scott Sigmund here, inviting you to check out some great information at the Business of Medicine session at the upcoming OSET Orthopedic Summit meeting. The session is sponsored by Veridime and will run from 7 to 10.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesday, September 18th in the Capri 6 and 7 rooms at the new Fountain Blue Hotel in fabulous Las Vegas. Okay, we have a special educational segment this week on the Ortho Show podcast. Think about this as a primer on electronic technology and clinical practice. I mean, I, I've been to some of these meetings now, and the overwhelming number of startup companies that are in healthcare technology, whether it's for EMR or for uh, billing reimbursement or machine learning, all these crazy things. And how are you supposed to know which company is right? So this episode is actually sponsored by Veridime, and we're bringing on two healthcare technology experts that are going to really answer some of these questions to help us to sift through the sea of sameness and identify what technology is right. And at the end of the day, we want to make our lives as physicians better. We want to have more quality time in our lives. We want to work smarter, not harder, and we want outstanding patient outcomes. That's what this episode is going to share. Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro. From medical media, this is The Author Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of the Ortho Show podcast, where everyone knows we bring you the best of the best in the orthopedic world. We're doing a little value added educational segment today. We're taking a little pivot. We're not going to be specifically talking to an individual, but we're going to give a primer on electronic technology in clinical practice. We have two experts with us today. Uh, first, we're gonna introduce Scott Stratton, who is the Chief Data Scientist and Director of Solution Management for Veridime. How are you, Scott? I am well, and yourself? I'm terrific, thanks for being here. We also have Ian Maurer, who's the Vice President of Technology for Veridime, and I love it. In his LinkedIn headline, he is a problem solver. Don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. I love it. All right, so listen. Let's get going here, guys. We're going to keep this basic as we can, right? Because we have a lot of, you know, non-technology people that are listening in and we want to keep it simple so our clinicians and healthcare providers can really understand this. So listen, I am part of the premier private equity-backed MSO uh, orthopedic platform, Spire Orthopedics. We have 175 providers across uh, the entire Northeast and everybody's going to be listening to this, okay? So at the end of this episode in this segment... I want them and all of our listeners to truly understand the benefit of technology and practice. So Ian, let's start off here with you. So technology for the sake of technology does no one any good, right? It has to do something that makes our lives better. How is technology going to improve the quality and cost of healthcare in your, in your estimation? Great, well, first of all, great to be here. Uh, thanks for having us, uh, much appreciated. Um, so yeah, great question, right? So um, obviously there's been a lot of buzz around artificial intelligence recently, and um, we really see it as a productivity booster, both for uh, back office and front office, as well as for you know clinical application, right? So I know we'll talk a little bit about some specific use cases in a bit, but I'm seeing you know a lot of uh, you know a lot of capability coming to the forefront that fuses that type of AI technology and automation so that the two can help to improve that productivity. So, you know, some examples that we're seeing, some real world examples that we're seeing include, um, you know, seven to 10 minutes of uh, savings per, per, per provider per encounter. This is an example, right? So i um, really excited to talk about some of those use cases in a bit. Fantastic. All right. So Scott, so, you know, and, and Ian just alluded to this, what is my most valuable commodity in my life? And that is my time. Right. And I watch some of my partners, they go home with a stack of charts because they couldn't get through their day and get through their medical record. And then they're working for hours after the clinic as well. That's not doing anybody any good. That's that's called physician burnout crisis mode. Right. So give us some con concrete examples of how technology is going to improve my quality of life by getting me more time in my day. 
uh, first of all, uh, thank you for, for having me. Thrilled to be on the podcast. It's a great podcast. Um, uh, you can think of it in different stages. The automation and AI and so forth will help in terms of organizing and prioritizing the scheduling of visits, uh, who you need to, to get in sooner, who needs follow-up, uh, who needs different kinds of touches to get them into the office in front uh, of the physician. Uh, the second piece is organizing the information to, uh, to help the provider have the most effective time with the patient as possible. EMRs are great, but they are voluminous and finding the nuggets that you need and organizing in the right way to focus on what are the real questions and problems, uh, particularly information that uh, may come from consultant reports and things outside of the core uh, EMR that come in as documents, still as faxes, amazingly enough. Um, so organizing that information. Then during the visit, you're starting to see the emergence of um, ambient listening, where the AI is actually listening and transcribing and summarizing the encounter. Uh, and then also post-visit automation to help simplify and pull together those pieces so the provider is more in a position of editing and approving um, and uh, making augmentation as needed. Yeah, I mean, it's time for us to work smarter, not harder, right? We, we can't, Absolutely. every day now we're asked to see more patients, push more buttons, uh, and now they want to pay us less as well, right? CMS is proposing another 2.8% you know, physician rate cut. I don't know. The teachers are getting a, a raise. The audio union workers are getting a raise. The Screenwriters Guild and Actors got a raise, you know, yet doctors deserve, you know, less money. It's really kind of crazy, but, you know, we understand it. So listen, so, so Ian, you know, my CEO is listening, right? And this is all well and good, right? But what's my return on investment, okay? So give us some examples of how investing in this type of technology can actually save money to the practice and improve your bottom line. Yeah, so we've been working on some really interesting, um, you know, back office automation and, and AI capabilities. So um, some, some examples there include, um, you know, automated payment posting as an example, right? So all of, if you think of all of the accounting functions that occur, in that back office, um, there's there's a lot of maybe you know wasted work effort, if you will, right? And we're seeing um, you know wage pressures and staffing challenges, right? Um, so when you can again bring in that automation and fuse it with AI capabilities, we're we're just seeing a, a pretty dramatic impact. And we've seen within our own RevCycle organization a two to two point five percent margin bump just in the adoption of, you know, just through the adoption rather of uh, automation. So really exciting things happening on <laughs> the back office side. On the front office, um, you know, Scott alluded to this as well, but there's, uh, you know, a lot of interesting uh, technology around ambient scribing that we're seeing come to bear that um, uses the, the uh, sort of, you know, encounter, ambient encounter, um, tech, that ambient encounter technology with the EHR so that the provider can really focus more on that patient to uh, patient to provider experience and less on having to, you know, enter notes or update notes, right? So uh, that's where we're seeing some significant time savings on the front, front office side. That's great. So I mean, so for our listeners, front office is really implying patient interaction, the clinical aspect of seeing the patients, the back office is all the business side of things generating revenue, you know, calculating expenses and coming up with the bottom line. So that's great stuff. So listen, you know, tech, you know, getting technology, it, it, it's not easy. I mean, I just went to Becker's, you know, six months ago and I went into their health science, you know, exhibit hall. And my God, there are hundreds of companies that are all involved in technology, startup companies. There's incredible overlap, right? How do we wade through the sea of sameness you know, and, and identify, Scott, who are the companies that we should be working with? Uh, basically, there's this kind of two classes of companies. In my experience, I've found in the analytics, there are those that have the solution in search of the problem. So somebody's coming out often of an academic environment, they've hit on a cool algorithm and so forth, and they're figuring out some way to monetize it. And they figure that healthcare's got deep pockets between pharma, health plans, and so forth. So that's a fruitful area. And so they're trying to find a fit. The, the other way are those that start from the problem and are trying to bring technology to help solve it. I always look for the latter. The more crisply you can characterize the problem or the need or the gap, uh, the 
easier it is to, to wade through all those different companies and seeing what their backgrounds uh, are and so forth. It doesn't mean that, mean that they have to have a healthcare background, but if they don't have strong clinical input, you're gonna have a lot more lifting on your side to make sure that they're sensitive to the concerns that you laid out before. Yeah, I mean, it's really drinking from a fire hose right now. If you're trying to independently go out, if you're in a group of private practice, got 12 docs, and you're trying to figure out what technology you're going to use, I mean, you need help, right? That's why we joined the private equity backed platform. We want to get, we want to be able to scale our business. We want to be able to grow our business. We want to, to develop best practices that we can identify and then identify, you know, a scaling event to help us to reduce our costs as well. So, so listen, we on the Ortho Show, we've got a lot of great people that come on board, and we had one of our favorite Singaporean orthopedic surgeons who's also involved in, in healthcare technology, Zubin uh, Durb Durbanwala. He made a really interesting point, one, one which really resonated with me, and he felt like the companies outside of healthcare but that have a history of technology that are moving into our space may be the ones that may win because they're thinking a little differently than what we are doing. Any thoughts on that? Healthcare technology companies like Veridime, as an example, um, have that longevity, have you know, have that industry experience, and are the ones I think at the forefront of innovation in the space. I mean, they understand. Obviously, you know, uh, we've been creating EHRs now for quite some time. We've practice management solutions, um, and we understand a lot of the challenges and pain points that providers surface to us, right? Um, and so. And we're, we're definitely in the best position, I think, to, um, you know, to, 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 to impact the, um, you know, the, um, the, the environment for the, for the positive here. Although I do think also there's a place for some of the more innovative startup organizations that you're seeing out there. So, you know, we have an open system, right? We, we, our um, philosophy is just, you know, open uh, care, right? Open technology. So we'll partner with, um, you know, a lot of startup companies and a lot of smaller organizations to leverage innovative technology where we see it. So we're doing a lot of that vetting on behalf of our customers. So, um, you know, understanding the entire ecosystem and plugging in vendors where there's challenges, other vendors where there's challenges, I think is, um, you know, one of our strong suits. Yeah, I just ordered my new car, you know, and like part of the fun is, is trying to identify what options that you want, right? With a company like mm -hmm. Veridime, you can circle through the rev cycle management, the EHR, you know, a lot of these things and trying to identify, you know, the best vendors that you're going to want to partner with and take that responsibility away from us. So I think that's right. really one of the strong points for you guys. So let's talk a little bit about some definitions here. Again, my mother, Judy, is listening, okay, and she always wants to know what we're doing here, but she wants to understand it in a way that she can. Uh, and so just give us a broad definition of artificial intelligence. We throw that term around, you know, routinely, but Scott, give us a, give us your definition of artificial intelligence. To, to me, AI is the, is kind of the umbrella of the types of analytics that are trying to mimic how the human mind works, how it perceives the world, how it analyzes the world, how it communicates with the world. And a lot of the different sorts of functions correspond to the different senses that we have and how the brain functions in integrating and, and, and so forth. So you have um, the sensory stuff, optical character recognition and uh, in, in those sorts of uh, image, uh, image processing, you know, have, have been radiology, also in orthopedics. Uh, you have uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the 3D virtual reality components and so forth. Uh, you have on the, the the processing side the machine learning pieces, which is where you're trying to mimic the thought process of of a doctor uh, in making a diagnosis or deciding treatment plans, things of that sort of nature. You have natural language processing, which basically is trying to understand the text and understand the nuances. And uh, we in the medical profession uh, generally tend not to be terribly great writers. Uh, you know, rhetorically, and so trying to get out meaning from often turgid notes can be a real challenge, and so technology can really play a role there. And then, as, as Ian was mentioning, a lot of the process support um, for helping to, to automate and deciding uh, ways to kind of uh, more efficiently package the, the information. Yeah, so I think that's one of your, your opening line there I thought was really fascinating, you know, trying to identify technology that helps uh, helps us uh, computers and things function like the human mind, right? Seeing what we're seeing, hearing what we're seeing, maybe thinking about what we're seeing, 
you know, we talk about it all the time. Like it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction between a doctor and a patient once the door gets closed. But wouldn't it be kind of cool if you had AI to sort of bring up the opinions of a hundred of the leading shoulder specialists based on the interaction with this patient and their MRI scan and trying to develop consensus? It'd be kind of neat. So, you know, I think AI really has a, a tremendous role within the healthcare. Now, they're already kicking me out of the operating room. We got robots in the operating room that are doing all this stuff. And now it sounds like you're going to let me stay home while I'm seeing patients as well. But we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, but, but seriously, Ian, so, uh, you know, uh, Scott brought it up a little bit, you know, machine learning. So I'm the machine, I guess, right? The orthopedic surgeon in the room with the patients, the machine. So Describe yeah. for us what's the definition of what what we what do we want technology to be doing for me as the machine? Sure, yeah. So um, I think you know tying all this back to um, ambient describing is um, I think I think really this is a good segue for that. So ambient describing, if you're not familiar with it, that's sort of um, an AI engine that's sort of listening to the encounter in the exam room between the provider and the patient, and sometimes with um, you know uh, mid levels as well. And that type of technology can do exactly what you're describing, right? It can surface different types of uh, clinical notifications as it's listening to the encounter happening in real time. It will produce, you know, the SOAP note or any type of other note output that the provider is looking for. Uh, it will surface those clinical notifications, sometimes even fusing in data from other, you know, third-party sources like you were describing, right? Whether that's uh, payer insights, payer data, right, to maybe help close gaps in care for, you know, value-based care scenarios and things like that. Um, and that technology can also, you know, it can, uh, you know, it can output diagnosis codes, it can output procedure codes, so that by the time you're done with that encounter as a provider, your note is done, right? And you've already got the codes, and it's really just a button push to get that data into your EMR. The discrete data flows into the discrete data fields, the note populates into the, you know, the note section of your EMR, regardless of the EMR, by the way, right? So it's, it's sort of EMR agnostic. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's a really interesting scenario where I see, um, or where we are seeing rather, you know, real world um, time savings, right, for, for those encounters. And obviously, then the provider doesn't have to do as much work uh, after hours or at the end of the encounter. So that's, that's really exciting. So the scribe is going by the way of the newspaper delivery boy, right? I mean, as technology <laughs> changes, things are changing. There's things that you you and I know, Scott, that probably Ian doesn't know from his life about, you know, there were actually rotary telephones and some other black and white TVs <laughs> and stuff. So it's kind of cool to know that, you know, technology is happening. And I find it interesting. You know, I've been doing this for 30 years. I do knees and shoulders left and right. So it's very rare that I have a story that comes in for a patient that I don't really know. I haven't heard it before, but usually within five minutes of them telling me the story, I already have an idea about what's wrong with them, right? We Then we do an exam. So it's really nice to get the mundane out of the way. You know, wouldn't it be nice not to have a tablet interaction in between you and your patient? You're literally talking to a patient as if, you know, there's no computer around. That's really, to me, really where, where we need to be heading. So that you brought up, so I'm assuming, so Scott, that's the na the natural language. The NLP is the natural language processing that we were just talking about for these automated scribe things. How about robotic process automation? RBA is a term that's thrown out a lot. Yeah, uh, so so that's the, the broad term for processes that help to do um, various sorts of, of, of uh, of, of, of automation of sequential steps and so for decision making and 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 so forth, it can be very sophisticated, such as or fairly sophisticated in terms of um, driving a car for you. Um, it can be you know in it can help guide um, surgical visualizations and and so forth things of of, of that sort of nature. Um, there's there's a, a a really broad swath open for uh, for applications in this area. I think over the next several years. Excellent. So look, guys, I thought what we do next is sort of move into some real life scenarios, right? That every day your healthcare providers are struggling with. One of my favorite things to do when I'm in my clinic is to break away from my patients to do prior authorizations, right? And then peer reviews, right? There's nothing better than having to leave a patient in the middle of a conversation to get on the phone with an orthopedic surgeon telling me that I did something wrong, you know, in how I presented this case and that they're not letting me do the treatment or order the test that I wanna do. So how is this technology, let's go with Ian first, 
How is this technology helping me with prior authorizations and eliminating peer review discussions? Mm, yeah. So actually, I, it's interesting. Um, I, I developed an intelligent automation program here at Veridime a few years ago where we use RPA and something else called DPA, which is digital process automation to automate a lot of, again, back office uh, you know, type of uh, workflows. And one of those, um, this was just sort of set up as a pilot, but one of those was prior auth automation. So we took uh, one of our uh, EHR products at the time, TouchWorks, it uses um, an underlying practice management system we call Veridine Practice Management now. And um, we were able to create a prior authorization um, submission automation, right? So the bots would actually monitor for cases which required prior authorization. When it found one, it would go and extract all of the relevant medical uh, documentation, clinical documentation out of the EHR, package it up, um, send it off through a third party. Again, you know, because we have a, an open system, we're able to partner with a third party that has prior authorization submission and statusing capability. Uh, so we were able to send that off and have it processed through and then, you know, get the response back and populate that into both the practice management and the EHR solution. Um, so that was really interesting. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, again, a lot of innovation happening in that place. There's e prior auth, uh, which is, uh, you know, a new standard around electronic prior authorization submission and things like that, which are going to be coming fairly soon. Um, so, yeah, really excited to see what, what happens in that space as well. Yeah. So for our listeners, what that means is if I'm in the opera, if I'm in the clinic with you in the office and I want to order an MRI scan and you've got Blue Cross Blue Shield and this, you know, and they're all the rules are different for each commercial payer and everything else. So, you know, the software and the database needs to incorporate all of that. But there's these boxes that need to be checked off from a clinical perspective that you've had six weeks of physical therapy, you've had an injury, you know, all of these things have to be included into the notes. So hopefully, the EMR that's developing technology will help us to pull that information out and identify what's needed instead of having to sit back and wait for my front office secretary to come back three weeks later to say we didn't get a prior authorization. So I think that's super helpful. And again, what I'm hearing seems to be a common theme when it comes to Veridime, which which is you guys are doing the background research, right? You're developing the relationships with these companies that you identify, you sift through that, you know, are the identity partners that you want to work with that can then scale this technology to, to your customers. So that's terrific. So we did, we touched on the EMR and, you know, I think we brought that up a little bit, but, you know, it really is going to be nice where, again, we're, we're not hitting buttons anymore and, you know, doing all this background work to be able to get things done. So I, I think we've covered that into the process. But, you know, one of the other things that my CEO is caring about, and all physicians are, right, we work hard, we should be paid fairly for the time and the things that we're doing. We want to have, you know, good outcomes for our patients as well. And that's reimbursement, right? At the end of the day, mm -hmm. rev like revenue, RCM, revenue cycle management, bringing in the money on the top line so that you can pay for your staff, turn the lights on and be able to do all the things that you want to do. So Scott, sh talk to me a little bit about how you feel technology is helping on the reimbursement side of things as well. Okay. So there's the the straightforward um, claim preparation process and making sure all the boxes are checked, the codes are correct, and that kind of stuff, which is stuff that, that we do. Um, the bigger piece, uh, particularly in the government programs, Medicare Advantage, Affordable Care Act, managed Medicaid, and so forth, is the role of the diagnosis, right? The all-important diagnosis for, for uh, what's called risk adjustment. And, uh, and that's an area that can uh, make the difference between a health plan making money or losing money on a product and staying in business or not staying in business, same thing with a provider practice. And uh, it's it's an area of, of great interest and increasing regulatory scrutiny right now because it's very strong incentive uh, by uh, plans on the providers to, uh, to make diagnosis codes, which they may not believe are necessarily fully justified in the chart. So what our focus on, is on is mining the chart both from the transactional component claims, lab results, other sort of easily quantified data, as well as from the charts, which is where the natural language processing, optical character recognition all come in to sift through and find it, the evidence for the chart. A medical records person would call it meat for um, uh, monitoring, evaluation, assessment, treatment. And you need to be able to check all those boxes to be able to withstand an audit uh, and, uh, and, and, and to formulate a care plan. 
And uh, a lot of our intelligence is around that sort of stuff, is identifying so, those pieces. Yeah, so technology that will help data mine through the, the computer to identify the appropriate diagnosis codes that are required to have appropriate reimbursement. So you're going to have less you know, less uh, audits, you're going to have uh, less failed payments, you're going to have less time on recirculating the billing that didn't get through right the first time, all of those things, that's time, which equates to money and staffing. So I think that's important. Ian, do you have anything to add as far as reimbursement is concerned? Yeah, I'd like to add just actually a really interesting use case we had recently um, for some of our providers that are in our uh, smaller practice segment. So a lot of them uh, you know, don't have a lot of experience with billing, and sometimes they're reliant on spouses or um, you know, other um, individuals to, to help them through the billing process that might not have the same level of expertise as um, you know, maybe RCM staff that we have internally at Veridime. So what we did is we took a lot of that subject matter expertise that um, you, know, you know, that industry knowledge, that domain knowledge, and baked it into a co-pilot that we now exposed through that EHR, uh, EHR, name of that EHR, it's Practice Fusion. Um, and this, this technology allows, uh, you know, the provider or the provider's biller to interrogate the system to ask about billing questions, just, you know, some sort of common billing questions, billing definitions, um, you know, questions that, that, that they might have on their specific claims and how to get them out the door. Uh, and this has been very successful. We actually saw it deflect 26% of those incoming questions away from our support staff. And you know, it's a win-win, right? Because the provider gets an immediate answer to their billing questions. Um, and, and we win because that question doesn't have to go to a human uh, you know, for sort of a manual response, right? So just another area where I think um, you know, AI is really, really helping to um, improve productivity on the billing side. You know, sometimes it really feels like it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? And so one of the things that we're going to talk about is clawbacks, which is a really hot topic right now. And I think it's it's the bad side, it's the evil side of technology that is sort of working its way up as well. And that is, you know, that the commercial payers have the same ability to grab this technology as we do as providers, right? And so if you're as a provider, if you're not using all of this technology to on the basis of your claim, on the basis of the reason and rationale for surgery, they can go back and pull up all the data and say, well, you didn't meet the criteria, even though we approved it, we've looked at it more carefully now. And not only was the surgery, you know, it doesn't seem to be indicated, but we're, we want the money back. Surgery has been done, patient is healed, moved on with their lives, and now they're asking for the money back. So how is technology going to help us as healthcare providers to be able to stand tall against our commercial payers? Scott, you want to go first? Um, sure. It, it's, it's a great point. The, it, it, it's essentially uh, almost a type of arms race um, where the health plan is trying to find reasons to deny or to claw back. And the provider is valiantly searching for the support to say, yes, this was this was legit. It was it was you know, the, the indications were, were spot on for, for doing it. And both increasingly are using the, uh, using the technology. Um, and when you were talking about prior authorizations before, uh, I just want to point out is, is that often the person that your back office is talking to about the prior auth is not a physician. It's a, it's a nurse and sometimes it may be just a lay person and they're following a script. And increasingly the plans want to be able to automate some of those scripts so that they can take the place of having expensive clinical staff on, on the phone and saving those for the appeals and, 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 and such. So um, a lot of our focus has really been around, I mentioned the, the care plan, because that's, that's the gold standard. The whole reason you're trying to make the diagnosis is you wanna help the patient and you want, to, you want to identify it soonest so you can intervene soonest, get the best prognosis. You wanna be able to document that, they're, that you're monitoring properly, that you're helping to get them in if they're tardy in follow-ups, you know, it's all about improving the clinical outcome. And, uh, and that's the best defense. It's called good medicine and being able to organize the information to be able to clearly document that and to demonstrate and to extract it for the health plans is really what's going to help the providers uh, succeed and fight the clawbacks. Yeah, no, I, I think that's well said. And it really is at the end of the day, we're taking care of patients. We are in the business of caring for patients. We are not in the business of withholding care. We're in the business of providing care. And so, uh, Ian, do you have any thoughts about clawbacks and what you can do, what Veridime does to help as far as the providers are concerned? 
Yeah, I think I'll just add that, you know, it, this goes back to your point about the um, vendors that we choose to work with, right? I think it is important to, um, you know, to, to partner with a group like Veridime, a business like Veridime that is being proactive in this space and thinking through ways to, um, you know, really, really help in this area, right? Whether that's, again, you, you know, through, um, you know, maybe technology that can proactively identify those types of um, potential clawback scenarios and surface them sooner, um, or, you know, data mine, right? And uh, and pull all the necessary information kind of to push back, right? But like Scott said, this is, this is an ongoing arms race and you want to have as much firepower in your corner as possible to push back. Yeah, I mean, well said, gentlemen. You know, it's been a pleasure having you on. It is a complicated world when it comes to technology and healthcare. And I think uh, it's really difficult as an individual practitioner or even a small private practice to be able to work your way through this and really truly understand. So I think, you know, that's truly where the strength of Veridime comes in, where you're developing these relationships, you're identifying the appropriate partners, you're helping to manage the technology, and then also improving revenue generation and great outcomes for your patients. So really, it's been a pleasure having the two of you on. We thank you so much. And uh, a few parting words for us, Scott, before we leave. Uh, I, I think... The, the real success, long-term success in the area of artificial intelligence is trust. Um, the whole reason I've been in this industry for my whole career is bringing together, I love operating at kind of the nexus of the clinical support team, mining data, visualizing data, formatting, presenting data to help compel better dis clinical decision-making, faster decisions, better outcomes. And uh, that, that's what excites, excites me every day. Um, with AI is the concern of the big brother, the black box that's somehow coming up with these decisions and you have no idea. A lot of the distrust out there, not just in the clinical but area, but in the general community is this black box mentality. So I think what's really gonna be at a premium is transparency and credibility. Uh, we pride ourselves when we work with providers of being able to show them if the machine helped arrive at a recommendation for, for something to look at, that this is how we process the incoming data to make it as, as, as trustworthy and, and have as much integrity as possible. Um, here's the, the algorithms that we used, and here's some of the main reasons that we arrived at the conclusions that we did, because if the doctor doesn't trust the information you use, the reasoning process, uh, they're not going to trust the recommendations and the outcomes. So trust in AI. The human, the mind. Yeah. Yeah. So trust in AI. We don't want the Terminator. We want to make sure that this stuff is all going to be beneficial to humankind. Ian, give us a couple of parting words as well, please. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm excited, right? I think there's, there's such an opportunity here to uh, increase productivity across the board, front office, back office, like I said, um, which will, you know, improve patient health outcomes. And on the EHR side specifically, I do see a simplification of, of the, you know, the user experience of the workflow where, um, you know, uh, the systems are controlled by voice and intent, right? Um, and I'm, I'm excited to be, you know, working for a company like Veridime where our mission really is to lower costs and, and help improve health outcomes for our patients. So I'm excited. I mean, I understand there's, there's definitely the skeptical side and some cynicism um, but um, I, I really, I really think we're, um, you know, we're on the cusp of some some really innovative technology coming down the pike, and I'm I'm really excited. Yeah, and you know, doctors are patients too, right? And the physician burnout right now is at an all time high. So if, if this technology helps to make our lives easier, be able to do our jobs better, and improve patient care, I mean, we're all in, right? We're all screaming for help at this point. So listen, it's been a pleasure having the two of you on. Really look forward to sharing this message. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro, host of the Ortho Show. Till next time.